We're continuing today with our study of the cross. It has occurred to me that it's somewhat appropriate that I should be presenting this message to people who are here for crossroads. I hope you'll uh, really demonstrate the truth of crossroads. By the time you leave, you will have had an experience of the cross that will affect the rest of your life. I think it's appropriate this morning to begin with a little review. Uh, my background as a trainer of teachers always influences the way I go about things, and one of the principles we taught was that review is an essential part of good teaching. So I'm going to suggest that we try, we, it means includes me, try to enumerate the ten aspects of the divinely ordained exchange which we have studied together without looking at the Notes. I mean, there's no sin to look at the notes, but just check, check your memory. It's, it's a test of my memory, too. I'm, I'm liable to miss one out. And I think we should do it with the left hand and the right, because that will fix it more firmly in your memory. So we'll begin with, He was punished that we might be forgiven. He was wounded that we might be healed. He was made sin with our sinfulness, that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. He died our death, that we might share his life. He was made a curse, that we might receive the blessing. He endured our poverty, that we might share his abundance. He uh, bore our shame, that we might share his glory. He endured our rejection, that we might have his acceptance. He was cut off or separated, that we might be united. And our old man was executed in him, that the new man might live in us. All right, we succeeded between us. Was there anybody, I'd be happy if one of our students would be bold enough to stand up and just say it on your own. Anybody want to do that? We won't, you won't be embarrassed and we'll be embar we won't be embarrassed if you don't get through it, but it's a good way of checking on yourself. Anybody want to do that? Hmm? Come on. Oh, no. <laughs> no, that's not the test. I don't know whether you've ever seen this illustration of the five fingers about how to in, uh, take in the Word of God. The little finger is hearing. The next one is this finger, reading. The next one is studying. That's the big middle finger. The forefinger is memorizing. And the thumb that makes the grasp complete is meditating. And why I say that is because hearing is essentially passive, reading is more active, but studying is much more active. And the result of studying is that you have something to pass on to other people. And one of the best ways of making sure you have something to pass on is memorizing. It may be old-fashioned, but believe me, it is the pathway to blessing, is systematically to memorize Scripture. And then, when you've done that, you can meditate. See, you can't meditate on something that isn't already there. And meditation is what gives you the final grasp on truth. You, you, you would do well to study sometime the blessings that are promised to those who meditate in God's Word. They are almost measureless. Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You can't do that if you haven't 
done the first steps. Then it says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He shall bring forth his fruit in season. His leaf shall not wither. And, listen, whatever he doeth shall prosper. There is no room for failure in that promise. Whatever you do will succeed. But it proceeds out of right meditation. You cannot live right and think wrong. And you cannot think right and live wrong. The key to success was handed to Joshua by the Lord. He said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. That's the threefold principle. Think God's word, speak God's word, act God's word. And then the Lord said, Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And God has no favorites. If you do what he told Joshua to do, he'll do for you what he promised to do for Joshua. There is no way that I can overemphasize the importance of the place of God's word in your life. It is ultimately the key to everything that you're going to experience. So, I didn't intend to say that, but just make that mental picture. Hearing, reading, studying, that's when you begin to be able to teach others. Actually, you really don't know how much you know until you try to teach others. That's when you find out. Memorizing, meditating. You see, you try and pick your Bible up without using your thumb. You can do it, but it's not easy. But if you have your thumb, it's no problem. And if you want to master the Word of God, you have to learn to meditate. And you can't meditate unless you've gone through the previous stages. All right, we now still looking for a candidate to stand up and try. Jesus never criticized Peter for walking on the water, you know that? He criticized him for not staying on top. All right, now we've got a candidate. Good and loud. <laughs> That's good, we'll remember that. <laughs> the person who never takes risks and never does anything. <laughs> What's that? That's right. Perfect. Well, it's perfectly right, but you've missed out one. Yeah. Is that your wife beside you there? Let her prompt you. You did it right. No, you did it right. He was made a curse. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You got to the tenth one. That's right. I think we need to give him a clap. Really, <laughs> really appreciate that. Now, we don't have time, otherwise I'd love to give other people an opportunity. I want to suggest to you, as a way of really mastering this material, that at your convenience and in your leisure, of which you have such abundance, <laughs> uh, you make that list in order, one through ten, and then beside it, you write down the scripture references that confirm each statement. Understand, like, for he was punished and he was wounded, it'll be Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, so on. Try and do it from your memory. I'm not saying memorize the scriptures, but memorize the references. Uh, it is extremely helpful. You are, some of you, in a counseling school. It's extremely helpful to be able to counsel people knowing what scriptures to direct them to. You don't say somewhere in the Bible it says. You say in Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin, etc. Uh, this, I'm, I don't insist on you doing this. Some of you it'll be an effort, for some of you it'll be comparatively simple. But I guarantee you that it'll stay with you the rest of your life on earth. You'll be that much richer from now on if you'll do it. 
Jesus said, with what measure you measure, it'll be measured to you again. That's very, very true in regard to the word. As much as you put in, that determines how much you'll get out. The more you put in, proportionately, the more you'll get out. If you never sow, you cannot expect to reap. Uh, what we're talking about here, that is sowing to your eternal nature, the incorruptible seed of God's word, and what you sow, you will reap. You see, there are laws that govern the universe. Paul said, whatever a man sows, that he will reap. It's guaranteed. If you do the sowing, the reaping is guaranteed. All right, we're going to go on now to page three. You have to bear in mind that page two was just a little kind of PS to page one. It got me confused for a while. I couldn't find page two. But page two is this little thing on the back of page one. So we go on to page three. And the first theme we're going to deal with this morning is two aspects of the cross. Now this is very important because up till now I've been dealing in a sense with uh, all the good you can get. Everything's been a plus. But there is another side to the cross and if I don't present that side to you and make it clear I'll be deceiving you or misleading you at least. And I don't want to do that. I was sharing with some of the leaders here an experience that I had some years back when I was a widower in between my two marriages and I had some dear friends, a couple that I took out for a meal in a rather fancy restaurant and I discovered in this restaurant that they gave two different kinds of menus. To the gentlemen they gave a menu that had the prices on. To the ladies, they gave a menu without prices. Well, this dear sister just looked down at the appetizers and said, I'll have that. It cost $22. And that was when $22 was a lot more than it is today. Well, of course, I was happy. I mean, I, they were my guests and I was pleased. But I knew she would never have ordered that had she known the price. And you see, I think that there's a rather a tendency to do that in the contemporary church. Preachers hand you the menu, but it's not got any price attached. Oh, I think I'll have that and that and that. I want prosperity and I want blessing and I want healing. That's wonderful, but there's a price tag. So, <laughs> you could find yourself ordering things that you're not prepared to pay for. So, I'm going to deal now a little bit with the price and we'll come back to that again later. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1, verses 16, 17, and 18. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. If we really comprehend that the gospel is the power of God, we'll never be ashamed of it. No one is ever ashamed of power. But if we don't realize its power, we can be very timid and apologetic about the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I have come to realize it's the power of God. Contemplate that fact. It's the power of God, almighty God, whose power is unlimited and measureless. His power is in the gospel. For in it, that's verse 17 we're reading now, in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. He's quoting Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, which is quoted three times in the New Testament. Never imagine that the minor prophets are unimportant. <laughs> Thank God for half a verse in Habakkuk, which in many, case, in many ways is the basis of the whole doctrine of justification by faith. So Paul says, in the gospel, and that is through the cross, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. 
Now, we have seen how the righteousness of God is revealed. Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. And notice, that's the righteousness of God. It's not human righteousness. It's not the best we can do. Isaiah says, all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Notice, not all our sins, but all our righteousnesses. The best we can do in God's sight is just like filthy rags. But the gospel reveals a different kind of righteousness. A righteousness of God. A righteousness which is appropriated by faith, not by works. That's part of the revelation that we've looked at. But it's not the whole revelation. Because we, we need to go on to verse 18. Now in the particular Bible I'm using, there's a heading between verse 17 and verse 18. And that could kind of give the impression that there's a break. But remember, that heading was not put there by the Apostle Paul. It's all right. Incidentally, I suppose you know that the chapters were not put there by the writers. There were no chapters. In fact, there, were no, there was basically no punctuation. It was just sentence after sentence after sentence. Anyhow, what I want to say is that verse 18 cannot be separated from verse 17. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Not only does the cross reveal to faith the righteousness of God, and only to faith, because people who do not believe cannot see the righteousness of God then. But it also reveals to everybody the wrath of God. God's wrath against what? Against sin. That's right. You see, there's a kind of tendency in the contemporary church to suggest that there's inconsistency between the revelation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament spoke about a God of wrath and judgment, and the New Testament reveals a God of love and mercy and kindness and forgiveness. That's really not correct, because both Testaments reveal both aspects of God. They reveal his mercy, but they also reveal his judgment. And it is, it is misrepresenting God and misleading people to present only one aspect of the truth. The cross reveals the wrath of God against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. In fact, it's the most total revelation of God's wrath against sin. Because in the Old Testament, the people who came under God's wrath had done something to earn it. But on the cross, Jesus did nothing to earn it. He was the perfect, sinless, totally obedient Son of God. If anybody could have commended sin to God, it would have been Jesus. But he couldn't. And when he became sin with our sinfulness, the full wrath and judgment of God came upon him because of sin. You need to bear that in mind. If Jesus could not commend sin to God, believe me, neither you nor I can do it. There is no way to commend sin to God. His wrath is against sin. His mercy is toward the sinner who will forsake his sin. But his wrath is always against sin. And that never changes. Actually, if you can mentally picture the sinless Son of God and what he endured on the cross, his beaten body, his bleeding brow, his hands and his feet pierced, the mockery, the cruelty, that's the most vivid picture that you'll ever get anywhere of God's attitude to sin. Far more vivid than anything that's found in the Old Testament. And we need to contemplate it. We need to receive the double revelation. The righteousness of God revealed only to faith. The wrath of God openly revealed. You want to know what God's attitude towards sin is? 
mentally picture Jesus on the cross. And that could be a remedy against temptation. Next time you feel perhaps tempted to indulge in something unpleasing to God, just mentally picture Jesus. And say, well, if that's the way God feels, I think I'll change my mind. You see, in Romans 11, Paul presents the two aspects of God's dealings. Romans 11 is written by the great apostle of the Gentiles, primarily to people of non-Jewish background, Gentiles. That is probably 98% of us here at this time. So it's a special message for us. Paul is talking to them about the olive tree, which, is, which has its roots in Abraham and the patriarchs, the good olive tree. And then he's explaining that Gentiles, such as I am, were wild olive branches that would not normally have borne good fruit, but we were grafted into the good olive stock and therefore qualified to begin bearing good fruit. But he said, never forget, you were the wild olive branches. Israel, the Jewish people, were the true olive tree. Now he said, some of them were broken off through unbelief, and you've been grafted in through faith, but bear in mind, you only stand by faith. Uh, let's read from... Romans 11, verse 19. Paul was typically Jewish in the sense that so much of what he presented is presented in the form of dialogue. Somebody objecting to what he was saying and then him coming with his answer. And he's saying, verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. That is, the Jews were set aside that I, as a Gentile, might come in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Don't let it go to your head. Don't become proud, arrogant, and self-righteous. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jews, he may not spare you either. 